Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Anybody else thankful that snow didn't stick around longer than just a few hours yesterday? <laughs> we were sitting there waiting for rain, and then we get four inches of snow, and where did this come from? <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys are here today. I'm glad to be here as well. A um, few quick announcements. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I did print out some new, or the next quarter of the Bible reading guide. They're on that back table back there uh, underneath the TV if you want to pick one of those up. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention is tomorrow, uh, kind of throughout the whole day, is Don Hamilton's memorial service. So uh, that'll be starting up in Gordon at Bible, uh, Bible Baptist Church, and then that's at 10 a.m. Uh, so if you're planning on going to that, that'd be great. Um, I believe there will be a lunch afterwards, and then the family's heading out to Alliance. And I, I believe we're all invited out to Alliance as well for the burial at the, the Veterans uh, Cemetery. And then following that, we're coming back here for a, a dessert and coffee type reception for the family. So um, if you can make it to one or, or not the other, uh, that's your choice. I would be happy to see you guys all there. Uh, I am planning on being in there as well. And, and we'll have a good time remembering Don and, and the life that he had. Um, other than that, the, the other stuff in here, VBS and, and Bible study this week on, on Wednesday, same as always, but let's be uh, specifically remembering Leona this morning and tomorrow in prayer and, and the family as well. Uh, but let's have a great time in worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Father, we thank you for how amazing you are and how you remind us of that, the, the amount that you care for us by giving us a, a day of snow to, to wet the land, to help fight fires that are, are burning across our state. Father, we thank you for the life that water brings and, and, and how it's going to help us in the future as well. Father, we thank you that you woke us up this morning. You gave us another day to come and worship you. It is a gift that you've given us today. So, Father, help us to, to close out all the other distractions from the outside world. Father, if our neighbor's distracting us, block that as well. We are here to worship you this morning, and that's it. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Good morning again, everybody. It's good to see each one out this morning. Our first song is "Christ Is Able," and uh, aren't you aren't you thankful that He's still in the saving? He's still saving people and and uh, bringing people to Himself. I invite you to stand with us as we sing this morning.
next song is Jesus, There's No One Like You. Psalm 86, it says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord. None are there, nor are there works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. We love you. 
scripture reading. The reading this morning is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, or on the back of your bulletin as well. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Father God, we thank you this morning that you have made it that simple. And yet, Father, often we make it into a much more complicated thing. Father, we thank you for your love for us and, and that you sent your son for, to pay the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. Father, as we looked at this morning, how quickly man has, forgets and falls back into sin. Father, we just thank you that you made a way for us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for this day, Father. Help us to think on you and worship you through the rest of this day and this week. <coughs> We give you the praise this morning for this day in Jesus' name. Good morning, church. I trust you still know that Jesus is still risen this morning. Amen? Amen. Easter was last week, sure, but Jesus is still alive today. And that's something that we could be happy about, excited about, to find joy and hope with today. We're going to be diving right back into our study in the book of Luke this morning because we've got a lot of verses to cover. So as Christians, as, as followers of Christ, we should be consumed with getting to know Jesus. Would you agree? Would you agree that we should be consumed with getting to know as much as we possibly can about Jesus? We should because by getting to know Jesus, we're getting to know what our Father is like. 
We can learn what we can expect from God. And ultimately, we can come to God through Jesus. Our scripture reading this morning told us that as we approach God, there are a few requirements that we are supposed to have. It said, and it is possible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So approaching God requires that we have faith in his existence, but also an expectation of a reward for seeking him. We can expect a reward. Isn't that great? As we approach God, our faith that he exists is essential, but it also uh, comes with this expectation that as we seek God, we will be met with the great riches that comes with having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and the creator of the earth. And that's the lesson, the, the, the reason I, I had us read Hebrews eleven six this morning was that it's basically chapter 18 of Luke in a nutshell. Chapter 18 of Luke features several people who didn't, or who wanted to draw near to God, and in each situation, they come to Jesus with this question, or this need, or, or a desire. And we'll see that with the exception of just one person today, and we'll talk about that later on, but, but all those who seek Jesus are rewarded. So if you would, please grab your Bibles, turn them on electronic, and find your way to Luke chapter 18 this morning. And we're going to be reading all 43 verses of chapter 18. Let's pray before we dive in. Father, we love you. Father, we are seeking you today. And as we seek you, we expect the reward of your understanding that you've promised us in your book. We want to know you deeper after today. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at five rewards from God today as we read through this passage. And I have them listed in your notes for you if you'd like to follow along. In the first parable that we're going to look at, we learn that God rewards the elect with justice. So let's read this parable. This parable called the persistent widow. Verse 1 says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of the city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. But this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think that God will surely give you justice to his chosen people who cry out to him, Day and night, will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have been faithful? So we start off by talking, uh, by reading that Jesus shared this parable with his disciples. And it's interesting to note that Luke gives us the application of this parable before actually telling us what the parable is. So the introduction was the application. He also does that with the next parable that we'll read too. But, but clearly, what Jesus wanted to teach his disciples was the importance of perseverance in prayer. 
He was concerned that they may lose heart. Remember, we're walking towards Jerusalem. Jesus is about there. We've got one more chapter before we jump into Holy Week in the book of Luke. And he's preparing them now. He's saying, keep heart. You don't know this yet. It's about to get really tough. So be persistent in your prayers. He was concerned they may lose heart. And that's, that's easy for all of us to do, right? Especially when, when we don't get an answer right away. It's easy for us to falter and, and quit or, or assume that God is simply not listening to us when we don't hear an answer from him right away. But Jesus encourages the disciples be persistent in your prayers. And that's something that we can take encouragement with too. We must remain persistent in our prayers. So Jesus introduces this judge character in the parable and he tells us that this judge doesn't care about God and he doesn't care about man. This judge was, was not the type to be moved by a compassionate story, right? Right? Sounds like the perfect type of person you want making decisions in, in a just manner, right? But then Jesus also introduces this woman. And she's noted for her persistence. She kept coming back to the judge day after day, asking for justice against her enemy. And though the judge initially wants nothing to do with this woman, because he lacked compassion, because he, he didn't care about anything outside of himself, he does eventually give in to her persistence. And that's when Jesus contrasts this judge to the righteous judge of God. He says, even this judge who couldn't care less about this woman eventually still gave in to her per persistence. And since this unjust God was finally moved, how much more would a righteous God who is moved by compassion and goodness and mercy and faith, how much more would this righteous God hear the people who are persistent in prayer? Unlike the human judge who, who had to be worn down first, Jesus says that, that God's justice comes quickly. The point Jesus wants his disciples to hear is this, don't grow weary in your prayer. And if we come to God in prayer, seeking him in faith, then he will reward us with the justice that we seek. Because there's a lot of injustice happening in our world right now, isn't there? It doesn't matter what topic is being discussed, both sides of, of every issue that is being argued right now are, are screaming and, and pleading injustice in what's happening. As Christians, we have a duty to to pray and seek justice. But we must make sure that as we pray for justice, we're not praying for our own justice. I'm not praying for what Trent thinks should happen in XYZ. I'm praying for what God wants to happen in XYZ. So pray for justice. Pray for God's justice in our world, our country, our, our state, our community. Speak out when it's necessary, when appropriate, but know that we can do so much more on our knees with our voices lifted up to God than we can screaming and shouting at somebody with an opposing position. First lesson is be persistent in prayer, just like the persistent widow in this parable. All right, the next parable that we, we look at here is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And from this parable, we learn that God rewards the sinner with mercy. Let's read this, starting in verse 9. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like these other people, 
cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I am certainly not like the tax collector. In fact, twice a week, I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So in the first parable, Jesus was speaking to the disciples. And in this one, he's speaking to a different audience. The audience changes. Now Jesus is talking to someone who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Essentially, he's talking to some Pharisees and saying, Pharisees, this is for you. It's interesting how self-righteousness and, and looking down on others often come as a package deal. Anyways, this parable was perhaps prompted by an incident that Jesus actually witnessed as he was traveling town to town on his way to Jerusalem. But in this parable, Jesus identifies two different men praying at the temple. The first man was a self-righteous Pharisee. The second man was a tax collector. And again, we see Jesus using the tax collector in an illustration because of the extreme social contrast between the Pharisees and the tax collectors in that society. Tax collectors were typically greedy and took advantage of their fellow Jews by overtaxing and profiting from the difference of what they had to take for the Roman government and, and what they actually took. So picture this religious person that Jesus paints here. He stands by himself. He's so righteous and holy that no one could come next and stand next to him, even in prayer. And then he presents this prayer and, and he rehearses these, uh, sp the spiritual resume and, and the contempt that he has for others. He includes the, the religious exercise that he follows twice a week of fasting and, and tithing and he expects all these things to be counted to him as righteousness before God. It's almost as if he stands in, in God's presence like he doesn't even need to bow before God. He stands there as if all of his works and, and his life make him acceptable before God on his own power. Now contrast this religious person to the tax collector who emerges as the hero in this story. The Pharisee stood up close front and center so everyone could see him. The tax collector stayed behind. He stands far off. He doesn't rush into God's presence. He doesn't assume he has any righteousness of his own. He's humble in his approach. He bows his head as if to say, I don't even feel good enough or, or fit enough to lift up my head towards heaven because of my sin. And he remains fully aware of that sin. He says, oh God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. He doesn't offer a defense. He doesn't try to rationalize his, his shortcomings. He offers no justification to God. He simply admits that he is a sinner in need of mercy. And Jesus interprets this parable by by simply stating the tax collector was the one who returned home justified before God, not the Pharisee. That word justified means righteous. It means being made in right standing before God. So you see that the tax collector wasn't justified by anything he had done. He didn't have this list of of acts that the, the Pharisee did, saying, look at all the good things I've done, now I should be justified before you. He returned home justified because he confessed his sins and he threw himself at the mercy of God. The only way a sinner can be 
uh, can, can come to God is by throwing ourselves at the mercy of God. And the self-righteous Pharisee, he went home deceived and, and believing that, that he was justified because of his works. But we know it's foolish to try to base our righteousness with God on the things that we can do. We have no case for our own righteousness. We are all sinners, and, and no matter how well we're dressed on the outside like the Pharisees or how dirty we are on the inside like the tax collector, we are all in need of God's mercy. Let's move on to the, the next passage here. And we're going to look at three different events that Luke writes about first in this, in, in this, as we finish this chapter. And the first event that we're going to look at is, is probably three of, of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. And from this, we learn that God rewards the humble with his kingdom. Let's read verses 15, 16, and 17. It says, one day, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. And when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. Then Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, let them come. Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom like a child will never enter it. So verse 14 ends with this tax collector who was exalted by Christ because of his humility. And then these three verses pick up on that same theme of humility. Here the, the parents are bringing their children to Jesus with the hope that he would touch them and bless them. Parents, that's our job. Our, our job as parents is to bring our children to Christ. And it doesn't matter if they're one, two, three years old, if they're in, in middle school or, or high school, it doesn't matter if they're grown and they have children of their own. Our job is to point our children to Christ. And that's what these parents were doing. They were bringing their children to Jesus. But the disciples tried to stop the kids from coming. They seemed to share culture's idea and attitude towards children at this time who thought they had no value, that they had no status in their society. Sadly, our own society, our world right now, has this, the same attitude towards children. They should be seen and not heard. And what's even more sad is that our, the church, not our church, our church does a great job, but the church as a whole neglects children and, and raising them up to understand scripture, to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for them. Most churches see children's ministry as, as a daycare system. Babysit my kids while I go sit and listen to some guy talk and drink coffee for a while. We should be bringing our children to Jesus. Jesus, on the other hand, had a much different view about children than, uh, than his society did. And this interaction demonstrates his approachability and illustrates the type of faith that's needed to approach him. He tells his disciples not to stop the children from coming and then explains to them that, that the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like children. He's not saying that that they, we need to be like children in the sense of being gullible or naive or, or, or childish. But one must trust Jesus implicitly the same way a child trusts a parent without question. This statement from Jesus should be challenging to us, right? Are we like the children that we read about here, humble and dependent and, and trusting fully on God? Children are, are, are constantly looking towards their parents for approval of any task that they are working on. They look to their parents to provide them the food and the sustenance that they need to survive. Children 
trust their parents for their safety and, and protection to keep them safe in all circumstances. This is the, uh, this, this constant looking up to mom and dad and, and dependence and, and trust and hope and humility is what God calls us as we look to him. That's what he calls us to look at him with, like our father. And Jesus says those who seek God that way are promised the reward of an infinite, unshakable kingdom. The next passage we're going to look at is, is a rather well-known passage. And it focuses on one of the major questions of existence. What should I do to inherit eternal life? And from this passage, we learn that God rewards the self-denying with eternal life. Let's read again in verse 18. It says, once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your mother and father. The man replied, I have kept all these commandments. I have obeyed all these commandments since I was young. When Jesus heard this answer, he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? There is no more important question to ask than this question right here. John 17, 3 defines eternal life as knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom God sent. Essentially, eternal life is, is that personal knowledge of God through his son, Jesus. So it seems to me like this, this religious leader, this rich man, he came to the right place with the right question, right? What better place to go to than Jesus when asking about how to inherit eternal life? But before Jesus answers his question, look at how he initially responds. He says, who are you calling good? Don't you know that only God is good? Now this isn't a, a denial by Jesus of his own deity. Instead, it's a, a question designed to lead this, this man along a logical conclusion. If he's calling Jesus good, then he must also acknowledge that Jesus is God. Jesus wanted this man to understand that, that uh, who he was by confirming his understanding of what he had just said. Good teacher. So after Jesus points out this truth to this man, he then moves on to answer the question by, by quoting the scriptures back to this religious man. He says, you know the laws, you know the commandments. And then he starts listing off the, the second half of the Ten Commandments that we read about in Exodus 20. And, and these things that Jesus listed would have been taught on the first day of, of religious leader school back in university. Knowing and understanding these ideas that Jesus lists here would have been like prerequisites for joining Religious Leader 101. So this man steps in and says, yes, I know these things. I've, I've kept these commandments. 
And that's when Jesus says and draws his attention to the commandment of having no other gods before God. He calls this man to practically demonstrate that he is following this command like the others he claimed to. Jesus wants him to prove that there are no other gods before God. And he says, sell your possessions and give all the money to the poor to demonstrate this. But in return, what did Jesus say? Jesus promises this man, after you sell your possessions and give everything away, you will have treasures in heaven. What a promise, right? A lot of times we forget about that part of the story, the, the promise in the story, don't we? We focus on the selling of possessions and, and giving everything over to the poor. And, and, and some Christians even use this as a reason to, to criticize and, and, and harp on other Christians who aren't living in just abject poverty. But there isn't a, a blanket command from Jesus here for, for all of humanity to live in poverty in these verses. We also shouldn't overlook the fact that Jesus, was trying, Jesus wasn't trying to bully this man into selling everything he owns because Jesus hated money. And without offering a ward and a promise of treasures in heaven. Unfortunately, this man must have stopped listening to Jesus the second he said, sell everything you have. Because it doesn't seem like he heard Jesus when he said, you will have treasures in heaven. Not only does this man have wealth, his wealth had him. And Jesus was calling this man to show the kind of faith that relinquishes this life in exchange for an eternal life. He required this man to lay down the things of this world so that he may have Christ. And for us, we need to understand that, that God is, is such a big God that we can't have our hands full of this world as we also try to hold on to him. We cannot hold on to our worldly desires and, and our, our wealth and our, our, our love for everything of this world while trying to hold on to Jesus at the same time. So instead of accepting Jesus' answer to this question, he decides to keep what he had. In his thought, he was losing nothing. And he went away sad. This man's reaction dramatizes the, the life choice of so many people who, who, who look at their possessions. And then they turn and they look at God. And then they decide to go back to their possessions. And this man walked away sad. But notice something that, that Jesus does here in verse 24. Jesus saw him. Jesus saw that this man was sad, and he had compassion for him in his sadness. And that's when Jesus points out that those who were still there with him, he said, how difficult is it for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven? And look at the responses to Jesus in verse 26. Those who heard this said, then who in the world can be saved? He replied, what is impossible for people is possible with God. And Peter said, we've left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone has given up his house, his wife, or brothers, or parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life 
in the world to come. Again, here we see the disciples thinking and acting just like the world. They think because they, the, the rich have access and, and ease in this world, they assume that the rich will have access and ease when it comes to God. They even go as far as to suggest that, that if the rich man can't get eternal life, then there's absolutely no hope for them. It must be impossible, they said. I love Jesus. What, what's impossible for man, which is everything, is always possible with God, which is everything. And that's when a small glimmer of hope turns on for Peter. He, he takes one little baby step in, in understanding what Jesus is trying to say here. He says, we've, we've, we've left our homes, Jesus, And Jesus assures them that, that no one who makes a sacrifice will go unrewarded. You and I, we must forsake our lives if we are to gain our lives. When we deny ourselves, when we deny our desires and, and our passions and our wants, that's when we find ourselves. That's when we find the kingdom of God and eternal life. The rich religious leader here was the only person in Luke 18 that went away from Jesus without a reward after seeking God. And he did so because he wouldn't deny himself the world. He trusted his treasures instead of trusting Christ. And I pray that you and I don't make that same mistake. All right, verses 31 through 34. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. Then he, he will be handed over to the Romans and he will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him and on the third day, he will rise again. But they didn't understand any of this. The significance of his words was hidden from them, and they failed to grasp what he was talking about. So Luke, through the, the direction of the Holy Spirit, orders this section very intentionally. In these verses, Jesus again meets with the disciples privately to relay to them the events that are about to take place in Jerusalem. He, he prophesies the facts of his, his death and his burial and his resurrection, but the disciples don't understand any of it. They heard it, but they didn't understand. Almost as if they were blind to the truth of what Jesus was saying to them as he pulled them aside. And now we get to the fifth thing that we learn from this passage. God rewards the blind with sight. Let's finish this, this chapter. Verse 35, as, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting beside the road. When he heard a noise of a crowd going past, he asked what was happening. They told him that Jesus the Nazarene was going by. So he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard, he stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. As the, man's, as the man came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, I want to see. And Jesus, and Jesus said, all right, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see. And he followed Jesus, praising God. And all who saw 
it praised God too. So contrast, if you would, the disciples with this blind beggar that we just read about. Because of this man's blindness, he was reduced to begging in order to survive. He was, uh, uh, we see him sitting at the city gate, and, and as the crowd passes, he hears the commotion, and, and he starts asking around, trying to learn what's going on. And when he, he learns that it's Jesus that's passing by, he starts shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, the son of David was a, an old messianic title, and it was prophesied that the son of David would rule on David's throne forever back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So this, this blind beggar who can't see and who has never met Jesus before, he knew the true identity of Jesus. He was able to see and understand more about Jesus than the disciples who could hear and see with their full sight. You see, the, the beggar wasn't present with Jesus in that private meeting that Jesus just held with the disciples in, in verses 31 through 34, right? He, he couldn't have, have known that Jesus had just used another Old Testament messianic title, Son of Man, from Daniel 7, right? So even though he wasn't there and, and he couldn't have known, the disciples missed it and could not see it while this blind man sitting at the city streets, he saw everything perfectly. And he prays, Jesus, the one who's been prophesied to, to sit on David's throne forever, have mercy on me. He sees with his eyes of faith he believes that if he seeks Jesus, then, then Jesus will reward him. He's hoping for those blessings that, that have been prophesied in the Old Testament with the son of David. And though the crowd tried to silence him, he would not be silenced. And when Jesus heard this man shouting, Jesus brought him to himself and said, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus essentially gives this man a blank check. What, what, what do you want? And this man asks for his sight back. And Jesus replied to him, all right. And instantly he was given his sight back to him. And I could only imagine what it was like for this man standing there listening to Jesus say, receive your sight. And the very first thing that he sees when he opens his eyes is the face of his Savior. Talk about a reward. What a glorious moment for this man. And we could only imagine what that'll be like right now. But one day, if, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, one day you too will see with perfect vision the perfect glory of Jesus' perfect face. And that will be our reward. So what? What? What can we take from chapter 18 of the book of Luke and apply it to our lives today? If you remember nothing else from chapter 18, please remember this. Jesus is our ultimate reward. Jesus will reward, reward us with himself, and all we have to do is believe. in all of his giving and, and answering of prayer, in the end, we will receive Jesus. Now go back to me real quick with verse 8. In verse 8, Jesus asks a question. When the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? That's the question I want to leave us with today. Are we a people who believe? 
Are we a people who trust God? Consider what you've learned about God, uh, about Jesus from this passage. He rewards those who seek him, so call on his name. Call out for mercy and, and trust that he will answer you. Consider his love for you. Consider God's love that is, that is proven through the crucifixion of his son. Meditate on the, the righteousness that God offers you through the resurrection. Confess your sins. Re repent of your idols. Give yourself wholly and completely to God this morning. Because he will reward you with himself. And that is the greatest reward we could ever receive. Amen? Let's pray. God, I look forward to the day when I will receive your reward. When I will open my eyes and I will see your face in perfect glory. Father, I cannot wait for that day to happen, but I also know that until that day does, we are commanded to share your love and share that truth with as many people as we can so that they can also get that reward. So Father, put a burning passion in our hearts right now to share that reward with as many people as we know. We thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Sing with us, seek ye first. <laughs> 